so we have only one more week left of the early life of Jesus. So can you help me put some of these chronological events, these events in chronological order? Are you ready? Well, they're in order, but help me know which ones they are, what they are. Who is this guy from our past sermons? This would have been a priest in Jerusalem. What was his name? Zechariah, right? And what happened? Well, an angel came to him and said, Zechariah, even though you and your wife are very old, you're going to have a baby, and this baby is going to grow up to be the forerunner, kind of like one of the last of the Old Testament prophets, the forerunner of the Messiah. Well, since they were old, he didn't really believe the angel, and so the angel said, I've got to give you a sign that I'm telling the truth. So the angel made him mute for a time. Then we read about this young woman, and from, you, from here, from the movies, who does this look like maybe? Mary, right? And she was visited also by an angel who told her that what is conceived in you is of the Holy Spirit. You will be the mother of God's son. But then something happened to her fiance. Who was he and what happened to him? Joseph. Angel came to him also in a dream and said, hey, do not have her stoned. Yes, the law said you could for adultery, but do not. Go ahead and take Mary to be your wife because what is conceived of her in her is of the Holy Spirit. She will be the mother of God's son. Then what did Mary do? She went to visit Elizabeth, her relative. Elizabeth was the wife of Zechariah. You remember? We talked about Zechariah just a few seconds ago. And she was going to be the mother of the forerunner of Jesus. Well, then six months later, nope, sorry, three months later, she was in her sixth month, what happened to Elizabeth? She gave birth to the forerunner of Jesus, and his name is John the Baptist, or baptizer. Very good. When Mary was nine months, she and her, her husband now went to a place because there was a census going on, and the name of that place is Bethlehem because they were, had to go back to his ancestry town, and it was there that she gave birth to God's son, Angels announced this to shepherds. Shepherd came to visit and worship this baby. On the eighth day of Jesus' life, two things happened. The parents gave him his formal name of Jesus, which means Yahweh saves, the Lord saves. But what also happened? He was circumcised, just according to the Old Testament law. And then on the 40th day, 32 day, days later, his, Mary and Joseph took him to the temple where they dedicated the firstborn he's their firstborn to the lord they offered sacrifices as the old testament law said but then there's these two old people that came up to him and what were their names simeon and anna and they recognized that this jesus whoops a little fast go back a little bit if you would simeon and anna they recognized that this was the messiah and they were led by the holy spirit to praise god Months later, now we go, now while living in a house still in Bethlehem, who came to visit this Jesus? These magi, these wise men from the east, probably Persia or Babylon. These are the first non-Jews in the Bible that we see to worship Jesus, these Gentiles. And then after the magi left, God visited Joseph in a dream again. And he, what did he tell Joseph to do? Get out of town. Flee to Egypt because the king Herod is jealous and he's furious. And he wants to kill Jesus. So what he was going to do, he was going to try to kill all the boys in and around Bethlehem, two years old and younger, and in the process, try to kill Jesus, this new king of the Jews. Well, I shouldn't do air quotes above Jesus because he is the king of the Jews. Herod was the king of the Jews. And then when the coast was clear, you could say they came back to the land of Israel, but they didn't settle in Bethlehem. Where did they settle? In Nazareth of Galilee, up north by the Sea of Galilee. And as we talked about a little bit last week, the only account in the Bible of Jesus' childhood was when he was 12 years old. And what happened when he was 12? They did their annual pilgrimage to Jerusalem for the feast of the Passover. And when they were on their way home, after a day's journey, Mary and Joseph said, well, where's Jesus? Normally he's in the extended family, but he wasn't there. So they traveled back to Jerusalem, and it was three days they looked for him, and they found him where? In the temple. And he was amazing the temple, the teachers of the law, with both his questions and with his answers. Today, now we jump in the, the scriptures, only have that, and then we jump to when, he, when Jesus is beginning his public ministry around the time when he was about 30 years old. Let's pray. 
May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable and pleasing in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So Jesus heads to the Jordan River where his cousin, John the baptizer, is baptizing people. And when he gets there, John the Baptist is more like, oh, wait, 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 wait. No, no, I shouldn't be baptizing you. You should be baptizing me because you are worthy. I'm not even worthy to untie your sandals of the strings of your sandals. But Jesus answered this way. He said, it's fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. You see, Jesus realized that in his baptism, he is fulfilling the scriptures of Old Testament. When Jesus was there, he got baptized. He saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. Look at that. A voice from heaven said, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Well, the Old Testament scriptures that Jesus is fulfilling by being baptized is this one from Isaiah. Would you please read this lower one with me out loud? Behold my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit on him. Now, Isaiah prophesied that about 700 years before it actually happened. 700 years. Isaiah was in a time when there were a lot of pretenders out there, like we talked in the children's message. These pretenders offered no hope. They tried, but there was no lasting hope that they could offer. Oh, there was the king. The people would often put their hope in him, in, in him but he would give some hope for a time, but never real lasting hope. And then sometimes the people put their hope in the flimsy hope of the, of the military or the politicians. And for a time, they would, might give some hope and some comfort, but it was never long-lasting. And then there was the temporary hope that they could somehow make their way through life on their own just by pulling themselves up by their bootstraps and being a rugged individual. And that might last for a while, but never really lasting real hope. And then, of course, there was the false hope that the false gods tried to give, like Baal and Asherah and Marduk, but pff, they offered no hope and comfort at all. And Isaiah exposed these pretenders as what they were, offering no real hope. They exposed him. And after he exposed them, the Lord then introduces not pretenders, but a contender, a real one. This is the chosen servant who will contend for us. And this is the one who will deliver on all of the promises of God. This is his chosen servant. He will exactly give the promises. This real contender gives real hope. This real contender would arrive like 700 years after the prophecy. This real contender is Jesus. Sunday school answer, Jesus Christ. Christ means anointed one. And he was especially anointed in his baptism as we're talking about today. Now, you think back about those pretenders in Isaiah's time, and you're thinking, oh, come on, those silly ancients, as some people call them, the ancients. How could they put their hope in these pretenders of all things? Well, when we're honest with ourselves, we realize that we can be just as silly as the pretenders back then, or as the ancients back then. We might not bow down to idols made of wood and stone, but you and I, when we're honest with ourselves, often are tempted to put things above God in our list of priorities, aren't we? They tempt us. This is one of my um, seminary professors, and he would say this about an idol. An idol is anyone or anything that we believe will give us what only God can give. An idol is whatever we look at and we say, hey, if I can get that, then I'll feel my life has meaning, then I'll know I have value, then I'll feel significant and secure. That's what we seek when we seek an idol, a false god. Now let me ask you, I'm going to list, uh, uh, give a little bit of a list. And of the things that I list here, I'm going to ask you, if you had to give them up for a week or two, which of these would make you have feelings of anxiety? Which of these, if you had to give up or abstain from for a week or two, would almost give you symptoms of withdrawal. Ready for the list? What about this? Your paycheck. Yeah, it would make me anxious, absolutely. What about your cell phone? If you had to give up your cell phone for a week or two, would you almost feel like a symptom of withdrawal? I know a few people in my lives that you, if they don't have their cell phone handy, they get physically agitated. Could that happen to you? 
What about this, social media? If you couldn't post or read other people's posts for a week or two, would you almost go through a, symptoms of withdrawal? What about family time? If you couldn't talk with your family and interact with them for a week or two, I would probably feel anxiety. I bet you would too. What about kids, sports, especially select sports? Because who knows, maybe, 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 the, in, it's a very small percentage, they might get a scholarship by playing sports and infinitesimal that they could become a pro athlete, but it seems very important at the time. I know, I know, believe me, I know. Would you feel anxiety if you couldn't take your kids to one of his or her sport activities, especially if they're in select sports? What about this? If you gave up alcohol for a week or two, that even that's just that one glass of red wine at night, nothing wrong with that, nothing wrong with that. Some say even some health benefits for that. But if you gave that up, if, would you go through some anxiety or symptoms of withdrawal? What about this one, word and sacrament? Oh, well, I don't know, that's, that's not a big deal, I guess. If I miss it for a week or two, it's wh whatever. If I gave up coming to gathered worship, I wouldn't hear from God's ordained servant of the word that I'm forgiven. Now, I don't have to. I mean, I can, I can just read God's word and know that I'm forgiven, and that's good. But it's kind of nice to have a specially um, mandated person to actually speak for God and say that I'm forgiven, proclaim to me, remind me that I'm forgiven of all my sins. Sacrament, the Lord's Supper. Well, it is the body and blood of Jesus Christ, in, with, and under that bread and wine. It's the very body and blood of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of my sins, but, well... I guess I could do without that. I don't think I'd be anxious if I gave up Ordin Sacrament for a week or two. See where I'm heading with this? If the first part of that list makes you anxious if you would do without your cell phone or social media or your family or your select sports or alcohol or whatever, if those make you anxious that you've got to have them, got to have them, but Ordin Sacrament, whatever, I don't, you know. When I get around to it, if I can fit it in, if I'm not too tired. If that's the case with you, I've got to tell you, you have a God, small g, but, if it's not, but it's not the one true God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. If that's the case with you, what's the solution? Repent, change, turn from that way of thinking, and remember what God has planned for you in your life. Just like the people in Isaiah's time, we often try to find comfort and our hope in these pretenders, or at least alongside the real contender, that is, Jesus our Savior. And that's why that Yahweh says to each one of us, no, here's my servant right here. Here's my chosen one that I've got your hope and salvation right there. Don't look for your hope and salvation in anything else. Here's my chosen servant. He was ridiculed and rejected by men, just like the Isaiah prophecies would say. He was called in righteousness, as Isaiah said, this chosen one of God is set apart from all the pretenders by a special anointing of the Holy Spirit at his baptism. And then as I close up now, after three, year, or three years after this event right here, he would have his public ministry. He would preach repentance and he would preach the, the good news of the kingdom of heaven. He will teach. He will heal. He will open the eyes of the blind he will bring prisoners out of the dungeon of sin. He will suffer and die for us bruised reeds. He will rise from the grave for us faintly burning wicks. You know, bruised reeds, and, or these reeds and these wicks, they were used for very ordinary things, like as a pen to write, or these reeds, sometimes as wick for a candle, they were very, they're not very worth very much, quite frankly. And yet... Look what God says about the one, his chosen servant. He will not break a bruised reed, even if it seems valueless, and he will not snuff out a faintly burning wick. Because the chosen one lived for us and died for those wicks and those reeds and, and came back and still lives for us now today. And this chosen one will lead us to recognize the pretenders in our lives, we will receive his full and free forgiveness and by the power of the Holy Spirit, he will lead us to find hope, not in pretenders, but in the one real contender. Let us pray.
Lord God, so often in our lives, we follow these pretenders and we put our hope and our faith and our trust and our reliance in these things, or at least alongside you. Help us instead, Lord, to put all of our faith and our trust and our hope and reliance in the real contender, your chosen one, your Messiah, your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen.